Good morning, church, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's lovely on the Sabbath to be able to gather across this country and explore the Word of God and know who we are because we know who our Father is and we know who our Redeemer is, the Lord Jesus Christ. So greetings to you in the name of, the, of our Lord, of our Saviour, of our King, of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. I have a key scripture today, and it comes from Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes to those in Philippians, and he expresses certain sentiments that really can speak to us today and help us on our journey. He says, The Lord is at hand. The last part of verse 5. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I, I want to focus not just on prayer today, but I want to pray, talk about on ceaseless prayer, supplication prayer. What is prayer and supplication? And I want to focus why Paul says that and the narrative throughout Scripture that points us in that direction. Supplication is pleading prayer. prayer. Well, you come before God, not in a perfunctory, out-of-duty, benign conversation, but you come to God out of desperation, out of love, out of adoration. And you love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And so you come with God to God in prayer in the most robust, bold, intimate, loving, respectful, full of adoration, thanksgiving, and your requests. We'll look at a few examples and we can compare it to our own personal life because, you know, you've probably had sermons on prayer, the discipline of prayer. I remember a man telling me once, we must pray for half an hour. And we must write down everything that we want to pray. And then we can say, well, look at Daniel's method of prayer three times a day, opening his window towards Jerusalem. Um, of course, we have Solomon's prayer, Hezekiah's prayer. We have examples of Jesus's prayer. But I want to talk more about the supplication, pleading, earnest prayer, where you wrestle with God on a very deep and powerful and motivating and compelling nature. And in doing so, when you really call out to God, you express a total reliance on who God is and how he identifies himself and your participation in that reality. You know, I know, if I'm honest, some of my prayer life has been somewhat routine, perfunctory, out of duty. I know God exists. And I know there's a, a compelling... Re, con, uh, relationship duty to read his word, to meditate on his word, to pray with thanksgiving, to intercede on behalf of others. But I'm talking about the kind of prayer that moves mountains. That's what Jesus said. Let's have a look. Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him. And he said, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he has seizures and he suffers terribly. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, you can relate to this kind of, God, help, help, Lord. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. Listen to Jesus' response to that. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18, And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could not we cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, If you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible 
for you. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe this statement of Jesus to be true? Because that's what Jesus offers us as an authentic life experience of the power of faith in prayer and the intensity of prayer. Jesus cursed a fig tree and the next day it had withered right down to the root. And Peter says in Matthew 11, Mark 11, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And Jesus answered, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Do we believe Jesus' words on account of his testimony? That's why I'm talking about earnest supplication, fervent prayer. Let's have a look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus says, Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And if you read the parallel account in Luke, he says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we begin to see a picture that when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, And he makes such extraordinary statements and expects and compels us to take it on board. Because the disciples said, we couldn't cast it out. Why couldn't we? And Jesus gives a very straight answer. You know, you and I serve a loving God, a righteous God, a merciful God, a forgiving God, a God who has an extraordinary purpose. And he allows his spirit to form us and mold us and shape us. And you and I don't want to live in the twilight of mediocrity considering there's a spiritual warfare out there. We need to be alert, equipped, stand strong in Christ. And anything lesser is dangerous. So I want to ask, is prayer an important part of your day? Is your time in the Lord's presence, in communion and fellowship, the highlight of your day? And you feel and experience and live by faith His abiding presence. You can bring to God your deepest thoughts, your total surrender. You can exult in praise and you can plead with him in intercession. Please, God, hear my prayer. I know you hear. Because unless we pray with deep passion and fervency, we will abdicate to a perfunctory, sleepy time, weakness, and the risk of derailment is high because it's spiritual warfare. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And yet there are certain reminders that help us. There's a beautiful prayer, I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby, temptations lose their power, when thou art nigh. Very old hymn. The risk of temptation and tripping up only happens when we are not praying in the name of the Lord Jesus to our Heavenly Father. And I want you to know what does God expect in prayer? That's a good question. What are the, what's sweet to him? In Revelation, we see the prayers of the saints coming up like incense, and it's pleasing to the Lord. And what does pleasing aroma in prayer look like? Certainly not perfunctory. Certainly not sleepy time out of duty. God wants people to boldly come before his throne of grace. Listen to Paul. 
we'll look at a few examples, and I hope it's encouraging and strengthening and empowering and equipping. Romans chapter 1, verse 9, for Paul writes as he begins his letter to those in Rome, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. So he says, God knows that I pray for you without ceasing. I call out to God for you. And this idea without ceasing is you like wrestling it. You won't let go. I care for my sh- the flock. I care for the people of God. And so I'll pray for them and I'll intercede for them and I'll come again and again, says Paul. Always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may at last succeed in coming to you. And he goes on to say that I may impart some sort of spiritual gift. And that's what I'm praying about. And I compare it to my prayers and I compare it to the prayers that I've heard people pray. And I wonder what it looks like. The epitome of wrestling with God is literal when the Lord met Jacob one night when he was afraid for his life and he wrestled with the Lord all night and he said, bless me. I want you to bless me. And they wrestled until dawn and then the Lord blessed him. Have you ever prayed like that? Jesus told a parable about an unrighteous judge and a persistent widow. And I think it's worth reading here because it can really speak to the difference of what we experience in this world and the reality of the transcendent, loving, merciful Father who wants you to pray, who wants you to praise, who wants you to bring his, your petitions to him. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. That's the purpose of this parable. And he said, In a certain city there was a judge who feared neither God nor man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Who cry to him. See, the the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah became so great that God heard it. And who was crying? Lot, for all his faults and failings, he cried out to God in desperate prayer. And the Lord and two angels came to visit. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. In other words, your loving, merciful Father will hear your prayer. He will hear your cry. He'll hear your desperation because you rely on him by faith. And then Jesus makes a very unique comment. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? That's in context to persistent, intentional, focused, passioned prayer. And Jesus asked the question, will the love of many grow cold? Will he find faith on earth? Will he find us praying? Not perfunctory prayer, really deep and meaningful communication in a personal deep sense with a transcendent, noble God, our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. If you go through the Scriptures, you can see a variety of people wrestling God. One of them that comes to mind is Job. He wrestled with the reality of God's sovereignty, his righteousness, and the misfortune that happened to him. Right at the very end, he says in prayer, Behold, I'm I'm of small amount. What shall I answer you? Another person who, who understood God enough to engage with him at a, at a working level was Moses. What Moses did was quote God's word back to him. So sometimes you can get the Bible and open it up and say, God, this is what you said. Jesus, this is what you said, and I believe it. And I'm here to receive it. Exodus chapter 33, 
Beginning in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. So he's quoting God's words. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, now he's quoting God again, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. It's very interesting prayer where you quote the Lord's words back to him as a foundation of favor. Do you think the Heavenly Father wants to hear his words recited back to him? Do you think Jesus would rejoice as he sees his own image in you? Reverberating and echoing back the very words he's spoken? So if you want to move a mountain, open up the scripture and say, Lord, this is what you said. And I have this big mountain in my life. This object that I can't get past. This oppressing, oppression, or whatever it is. And you make certain promises. Verse 13, Now therefore, if I found favour in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favour in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. So have you tried to read Scripture back to God as a starting point for a deeper conversation? God, you said, Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you said. You know, in monastic circles, it's, record, it's, it's regarded as lectino divina, where you read Scripture back to God. You pray and meditate in Scripture. You find a quiet space. You find a time in your life when you're not in a hurry, you're not tired, and you're receptive to God's Word. And you take the Psalms and you read a Psalm or you read some of the words of Jesus or, and you recite them slowly and meditatively in God's presence. There are seasons in your life when you need to do that. You know, the Lord says to Isaiah, we find this in Isaiah 59, the first verse, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or is he a dull that he cannot hear? He's talking to a sinful people, and they're wondering why their prayers are not being heard. God hears our prayers. He numbers the very hairs on our head. He knows us. He knew us before the foundation of the world. Let's have a look at Jesus. Because if you want to look at the relationship between the Son of God and the Son of Man and His Heavenly Father, look no further than Jesus, because we have insight into what relationship looks like. And the book of Hebrews tells us, surprisingly or intriguingly, chapter 5, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. So there was a time for prayer and there was a time for supplication. And supplication is beseeching, pleading, intense prayer. With loud cries and tears. When was the last time you prayed with loud cries and tears? Many of us pray whisper quiet. But sometimes it's nice to have a place of prayer far away from listening ears. To call out to God in prayer. To call out loud. God! To him who was able to save him from death. That's an interesting thought. Jesus knew that was the purpose he came, and yet he prayed for that kind of divine deliverance. And he was heard because of his reverence. Let's look at that in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, verse 40. And when he came to the place, he said to his disciples, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is a difficult time. I want you to pray. But the disciples fell asleep. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So the book of Hebrews says, and he was heard because of his reverence. How do we know that the Father heard that prayer? Well, in Luke 22, verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. So the Father didn't take the cup away from Jesus, but he sent an angel to strengthen Jesus, to go through the ordeal, because it was desperate. If you know that the next day you're going to be executed and you're going to spend six hours nailed to a cross in agony, it's 
not an easy thing to contemplate. And the scripture spoke clearly of how Jesus would die. And being in agony, in verse 44, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Have you ever prayed of that degree? I have a friend who lost his wife recently. He's about my age. Been married for 39 years. He said, God, take my life, not hers. That's what love does. You come before the throne of grace to seek God's will, whatever it is. So have you prayed to God like that in desperation? And not only to wait for the desperate moment, but to pray to God with earnestness and ferventness and supplication all the time. You know, um, well, you and I understand James's encouragement and instruction. James chapter 5, verse 15. You know, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. So when I pray for somebody who's sick, I pray and ask God for forgiveness. I pray for his healing. I anoint that person with oil and trust that the Lord will raise him up. And then I will pray words that saying we don't come, God, in, to your presence in, on our own merits. We come before you because of your mercy, because of your promises, before your, because of your grace. And then, like in the example of Jesus, tell the person on whom has just been recipient of this mercy, don't tell anyone, but go and give God thanks for his mercy and his healing. Your faith has made you well. Remember Jesus' words? Many times he said to those he healed, your faith has made you well. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. We understand that. We practice that. Therefore, confess your sins for one another and pray for one another. When we live in community, in fellowship, we learn what it is to care and love for one another and intercede for one another and pray about the minute details. If the Father in heaven numbers the very hairs on our head and notice every little bird that falls, God is not distant or far removed. He's a very present help in time of need so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. But the next part of the sentence, sometimes we have problems with. James uses the example of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on earth. Have you ever prayed that it might not rain in order that the gospel message can be embedded in the stubborn hearts of people? Now, we struggle with examples like Elijah. We struggle with Jesus saying, say to this mountain, be moved, and it's moved. God wants us to engage with him. And the best relationships are the most robustly lived through good times and through difficult times. And this is what the Lord said via Isaiah. He was talking to a rebellious people, but he's reaching out to them for this level of engagement. Isaiah 43 verse 26 the Lord says, put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Another translation says, let us contend together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Now, he's talking to rebellious people, but he's opening up the door just like Job. Now, Job was proven. His self-righteousness was very strong, but he was righteous and he contended with God. God invites dialogue on the most robust level. We see this with Jacob wrestling God. I mentioned Job. Read his story. He wrestles the reality of divine providence and God is given and God is taken away. Blessed be the name of God. But then he wrestles with that reality. We see Hannah in the tabernacle praying. She was suffering as a second wife the rigors of infertility and the shame it brought her within that community and the Lord heard her prayer we see this with Hezekiah's prayer Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah and said okay get your house in order you're going to die and Hezekiah suddenly prays he says and, and Isaiah walks out and Hezekiah goes oh Lord Please remember how I've walked with you in faithfulness with a whole heart 
and I've done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And as Isaiah was walking away, the Lord says, I'll go back to him. Tell Hezekiah, I'm giving him 15 more years. He will be healed, etc. Brothers and sisters, men and women of faith have petitioned long many times a loving God for a delivering hand. And God heard Hezekiah's prayer and moved the sundial even back as an affirmation for the king's limited comprehension. What about Abraham? Abraham's a friend of God, father of the faithful. He made numerous mistakes. But Abraham, like Hannah, experiences no child via Sarah. And so he comes to God and he says, Oh Lord God, what will you give me? This is, I think, the first prayer that we hear in, um, in, in the Bible. What will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Eliezer was a godly man. He was a servant. And the idea of an heir was very important. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given to me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So Abraham's praying. He states what the obvious problem is. It's not that God didn't know. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your own heir. And the Lord brought him outside and said to him, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham asks for an heir, and God says, Look at the stars. Helen Steiner Rice once wrote, You know, we ask for a cupful when the vast sea is ours. We pick but a rosebud from a garden of flowers. God offers us so much, but we engage with him. Abraham just wanted one son. And God says, I'll give you children like the stars of the sky. There are hundreds of prayers in the Bible, literally hundreds of them. And I want to mention that, you know, I mentioned the prayer of Abraham. Do a personal study. There are nine prayers in Numbers, nine prayers in Judges, and nine prayers in Nehemiah. There are seven prayers in Job. Did you know that there are 72 prayers in the book of Psalms? There are 11 prayers in Jeremiah, 17 prayers in Matthew, six prayers in Acts, and then you have eight prayers in Revelation, consisting of elders in worship, angels in worship, all creatures worshipping God. You have the martyrs praying for vengeance. You have a great multitude in worship. You have angels again in worship. You have the glorified saints worshipping God. And at the very end of Revelation, you have a five-word prayer. Revelation 22, verse 20, John prays. Jesus says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And John prays, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer. It was a prayer worthy to be recorded at the very end of Scripture. When you look at ministry, you realize that ministry, those pastors among us who serve us, dedicate their lives to the Word of God, thus says the Lord, and also to prayer. Paul said it in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. He said, We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. That's very interesting. So there's a greater accountability of devotion to prayer. So, brothers and sisters, those men among us who have a calling, when I talk to a young man about ministry, the first thing I and compel him to do is commit it to prayer. Wrestle it in prayer. If you feel you're being called to serve the Lord in Jesus' name, commit it to prayer and then follow the compelling steps that go beyond that. You know, look at Jesus' life as we begin to wrap this up. The busyness of life can sometimes overwhelm us and we go to bed at night so physically tired and drained from the day's activities that our prayers, uh, if they happen at all, are somewhat perfunctory. What about Jesus? Luke chapter 5, verse 15. 
But now even more, the report of Jesus went around and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. It was busy. It was on the go. 5,000 here, 15,000 there, 4,000 there. Everywhere he went. But, Luke says in verse 16, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Why would he go to a desolate place? Because he could cry out aloud. And many of those prayers were with tears. Let me quote the scripture that we began with. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so you can say, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Final scripture for today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I hope today's message has been of divine encouragement and compelling nature that if there is any redress in our lives, if we've been coasting along in the twilight of mediocrity, now as I say, Father, forgive me. I didn't realize when I asked for a cupful, the whole sea exists. That Abraham prayed for a son and God says, I'll give you so much more. Mountains can be moved. The name of Jesus upheld. And brothers and sisters, as we near the time of Jesus' return, the only way that we will be alive in the Spirit is to read His Word, know His Word, come to Him in prayer, and in many occasions, recite from the heart His own Word and bring your requests to God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of the Church of God Seventh Day, here in Australia, I'm your brother, John Classic. God bless you all. Thank you.